Welcome back. Panelists here, Republican strategist Al Cardenas, Yamiche Alcindor, White House correspondent for PBS NewsHour, NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Casey Hunt, host of MSNBC's KCDC, and Democratic pollster Cornell Belcher. And yes, if you're wondering, there are three Miami natives on this. <laughs> oh, right. Sorry. Hey, well, sorry, guys. The All right. Um, Cornell, this is your party, so you get the first word. Um, what did we What? Take a step back here. What do we now know that we didn't know before the debates? I think I think we now know that um, <laughs> that we have a, a, a lot of diversity in the party, but also a lot of people who putting forward policy ideals. And it, I, for me, it was largely a, a debate about policy. Even the exchange between Kamala and, and Biden uh, was largely about a policy about, about about busing. I think you also look for me. Did some of the candidates move the bar? Yes. I think Senator Harris moved the bar. Mm -hmm. I think she 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 gave Joe Joe Biden a punch, and he didn't react very well to it. No, he didn't. Uh, I think she. I think a lot of voters are now looking at her mm -hmm. differently than they looked at her before, and that's what you want to do. The debate. We talked about having a moment in the debate. Yep. Senator Harris had a she moment in the debate, it. and I think over the next two months, you you will see her poll numbers begin to rise. I predict Chuck that she is going to be the next front runner, although. I I think we're going to have four or five front runners before it's over. That's an interesting. Here's what Ed Kilgore wrote um, uh, in New York Magazine, uh, Casey, th that Biden's bad night exposed some dangerous weakness for him. One, his age and the associated impression that he's not up to the job and perhaps is just living in the past. Two, his possible complacency as the early front runner. And three, his heavy dependence on African-American voters for his current lead and his clear vulnerability in his record and racially sensitive issues. That is, much as it was a big moment for Harris, that this is probably the more important takeaway. Uh, I mean, they're, they're all great points, and, and I do think it's it's that big picture. It's everything taken together about what we saw with Joe Biden standing on that stage. This idea that uh, he's almost been running a Hillary-esque campaign where he's been the front runner. He hasn't wanted to appear on the same stage with a lot of his rivals very frequently. He's doing a lot of these high-dollar fundraisers where he's making comments that when taken outside, you know, out of the context of that room, you know, the voters who are focused on populist policies feel like they don't, his comments don't quite sound right. And, and all of those questions that are kind of underlying this, that people are, you know, not, we're a little reluctant to push it right into the center, but, you know, the president has been using this criticism that, you know, the, the basically that the vice president has lost a step and every single thing that the campaign and that the candidate in Joe Biden does that feeds into that is a problem for them. Yamish, here's what Michelle Goldberg wrote after Kamala Harris's, uh, because I also think this is important. There was near universal consensus that Kamala Harris triumphed on Thursday, scoring a devastating blow against Biden in an exchange about busing. The question now is whether these victories can convince battle-scarred Democratic women to believe once again that a woman can beat Donald Trump. I think what we learned uh, this week was that this is really that, that exchange between Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris and Joe Biden was really, I think, at the core of what the Democratic Party is mulling over. She started that exchange by saying, as the only black woman on this stage, I want a, a minute to talk about race. And I think what she was doing there was putting her race at the center in a way that sometimes people are worried about candidates doing, but putting her actual personal story out there. I think by doing that, she did something that Joe Biden couldn't compete with. It wasn't just that he didn't have an answer. It was that he can't say, I was a little girl on that bus. And I I think when you watched him kind of try to get the story right and try to get his explain, explaining right, over the last couple of days, they haven't been able to get it right. And the aides that I talked to understand that a lot of that is because they're still struggling with this idea that he does have these quotes. He called busing an asinine policy. He yeah. said that it was a liberal train wreck. He wanted a constitutional amendment. And then to add to that, there are, these are these issues that are still going on right now. A study done just last year showed that there were black and brown students who are increasingly attending racially segregated schools. So what we're dealing with is not an issue from the 1970s, but an issue that's going on right now. Al? Bigger picture here. David Brooks wrote something on Friday that I guess would ring true to your ears as well as it might have to moderate Democratic ears. The debates illustrate the dilemma for moderate Democrats. If they take on progressives, they get squashed by the passionate intensity of the left. If they don't, the party moves so far left that it can't win in the fall. Right now, we've got two parties trying to make moderates homeless. As somebody who has been a Trump skeptic, uh, yeah, never Trump or at times, uh, it's yeah. suddenly like, our, you know, are we I view this debate, uh, Chuck in the eyes of someone who was looking for a possible alternative to Donald Trump. Somebody you want to support. Right. right. Some, and so who said things that I kind of liked? Amy Globachar, uh, you know, uh, Mike Bennett. 
Mm -hmm. uh, maybe even Congressman Joan Delaney. But man, <laughs> after the end of the two debates, I said to myself, that stuff got nowhere. And so, uh, yeah, there were a few things said that I could find uh, an option for, mm -hmm. but it didn't, man, it didn't make any ground. Right now, if this was the Indianapolis 500, you know who the th three candidates in the row are, the three candidates in the second row. All of my candidates are in the back row. I mean, <laughs> no one really made a splash. Cornell. Can I, can I go yeah. in on yeah. this? Because this, this, this annoys me to no end. Look, to all respect to, to, to Brooks, we don't need you. Right. We don't we don't need you. Right. We need to rebuild the Obama coalition. Right. So. So when you when you talk about who who's problematic and this is my problem with 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 Joe Biden, I fear with Joe Biden that he's Hillary 2.0. Chuck, I sat in focus group rooms with the younger uh, voters, particularly younger voters of color, and, and they brought up the super predator stuff with Hillary Clinton. Mm. And they said we cannot, you know, they're not going to make the binary choice between lesser two evils. And I think th the problem is Joe Biden becomes Hillary 2.0. We need a candidate who can inspire and build back those, bring back those young people and rebuild the Obama coalition, a majority coalition, back-to-back -back majorities built on young people and expanding the electorate, not going back to the 1992 campaign again. I mean, my sense is they need both of those things. They need what Cornell is talking about, but they also need some of these twice Obama, once Trump voters from these Midwestern states. And the question is, who can thread that needle? And I think the question for Biden is, can he electrify those people that Cornell is talking about? I see little evidence that well, that's not if you have to talk about busing <laughs> right in every now, debate. I mean, that is no way to electrify <laughs> right? any color. Yeah. Look, Chuck, the, as a as a Trump uh, as a Trump skeptic, I see this campaign shaping up into two forty percent bases talking past each other. Uh, that uh, that middle is going to be a forgotten middle. I don't see any energy in the middle in either party. Nope. Uh, I don't think any campaign strategy is going to be based on appealing to the middle. I think this is going to be a base turnout campaign. And I, I don't know if these debates are going to change my mind. To someone like me, that's disappointing, but, but it's but fact. Personality is going to matter immensely. I mean, the idea that you're just going to run against Donald Trump on policy is absolutely ludicrous. Right. And, and one thing that Kamala Harris demonstrated was, you know, yeah. she married her chops as, you know, a, a politician with smarts with her personality. And, it and really she showed. looked Joe Biden in the eye and showed that if she was on a stage with, with Donald Trump, she wouldn't just be beating up on him. She'd be looking him dead in his eye and saying, you're going to have to explain the consequences. Of and we got to go. But I hate Thank the God. ideal that a woman that we're asking a question, can a woman beat Donald Trump? We never ask that question of a man. Men lose all the time. I, <laughs> yeah. Guess what? Cheers. We're going we're gonna to talk about Trump's reaction to all these debates the next time we get together. But hey, NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and then click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.